understanding. Um, a segment of which I'm going to try and present later, uh, sometime in the future, a, a, a more rigorous sort of account of subjectivity. But this is, again, this is just my sort of ghetto philosophy, right? This is, this is, none of this is properly speaking Spivak. This is all concepts you need to have an understanding of. It doesn't need to be a deep understanding, just, just, a, just, just a good enough understanding to, to be able to delineate terms and concepts. So I, I've labeled this traditional model, right? The traditional. Right? So I've labeled this the traditional model of subjectivity, right? The traditional model of what a subject is. She doesn't say this, right? And I'm not saying that Spivak says this, but it's my lecture and it's my interpretation. But what's being sort of suggested is that Deleuze and Foucault, they, they sort of they're on the traditional model. They're on the traditional interpretation of the subject. Um, and I'm not going to go into sort of the, 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 the French post-structuralist movement and all that other stuff. Not, not in this part. It's too, it's too dense to get into that. But there is a sense in which um, you could arguably say that an interpretation of Spivak's piece, Can the Subaltern Speak, is sort of an indictment, if you will, on the lackadaisical nature in which you know, laissez-faire in the real sense, I guess, uh, in the figurative sense, but this sort of, this sort of lackadaisical nature in which um, post-structuralist scholars have gone about discussing subjectivity. They do it in this traditional model. Now, this idea of traditional model is my own sort of vernacular. What does that mean? The subject in this traditional model is unified, right? The subject is unified in this traditional model. I am not saying, right, Foucault does this. I'm not saying Deleuze does this. I'm just saying one interpretation you could possibly have of Spivak's account of the subaltern is that um, Deleuze and Foucault sort of ascribe to this more traditionalist model. And the traditionalist model is like, you know, we want our ends to be tidy. We want everything to, we want it to, and I'm being, I'm being facetious here, right, but we want our, just, to, I'm exaggerating, to make the point, right? I'm an educator, I want you to understand this, right? So one, one sort of extreme is to say, listen, when we're talking about the subject, all of our ends need to be tidied up. We want to make sure that it, our subject is this unified whole because it, this unity reflects the, the embodiment as, as one individual. I, Jason Campbell, am me. Um, so the subject becomes unified. This is like sort of undivided. What I wrote is the subject is undivided, that is, Within me, my desires, right, specifically, and my interests are united, right? So my desires and my interests are united. And that's important, right? So that desire and interest desire and interests are united. Now, quick, quick sort of description. I have a really difficult time um, being a being a conflict resolutionist, but I love it. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. I'm glad I'm trained as a philosopher, but teaching peace studies and conflict resolution because I feel like I'll have a greater impact on the world. Aside from all of my lecturing, you know, when I finally get down to just cranking out these books, <laughs> which is what I'm doing. Uh, you know, ten years from now, I look back and be like, yeah, you know, I, I, I hope I made, you know, I hope I made the world a better place. I mean, think about what Galton has done. Think about what Spivak's done. Think about what these great scholars have done. Their work hasn't just sit on a shelf. They changed the world and made the world a better place. That's a huge thing. For conflict resolution, the discipline is relatively new, um, and I have a problem. One, being the new kid on the block and being very young. Um, but also, my training as a philosopher, I don't want, you know, you don't want to come in and say, you know, you guys are equivocating here. This language is improper, right? Because it's, you know, so I'm going to do my own work. The idea is, within genocide scholarship, because I do this for a living, is to look at um, and analyze genocide. So, within the act of genocide, for example, as a collective act, you can imagine, right, that an individual um, proponent an individual perpetrator of an act of genocide has the desire 
to destroy some targeted population. I don't like the um, I don't like the Tutsi. Therefore, we're going to eradicate the Tutsi population. Or conversely, I don't like the Hutu. Therefore, we're going to eradicate the Hutu population. I have this desire. That's sort of a general um, general distinction. And the idea is to think that my desire and my interests are one and the same. And I would also add my intent, right? Because that's what I'm doing. The book that I'm currently revising now has to deal with part of this, um, right? So that my, even my interest and my intent, um, there's this sense in which people want to conflate the terms, right? My desire is the same as my interest is the same as my intent. If there's one thing we recognize in Spivak at this very early point, and I even have I haven't even gotten into Spivak is is you have to take my word for it, um, is that Look, Spivak's going to want to delineate these concepts, right? Is desire really the same as uh, interest, right? Is desire really the same as interest? Are desire and interest sort of neatly packed in this account of, in this sort of French post-structuralist account of, of subjectivity, right? Is it the case that when we're talking about the subjective being, the subject I, that I am a collection of my desires and interests? and that these desires and interests are sort of how I define my existence within the world, right? Um, there is a huge body of scholars that would say, yes, that is exactly how you define your interest in who you are in the world, right? A lot of, not, not all, but the, a lot of psychoanalytic theory comes out of this, this tidied, unified subjectivity. A lot of uh, psychoanalytic theory does not come out of this. Uh, so there's a split in scholarship, right? So I just want to give you an idea. Desire and interests are sort of tidied up, unified within the subject. And it's obviously desire and interests that serve as this precondition for subjectivity. In a Freudian sense, I've already done this with respect to my analysis of Lacanian psycho uh, psychoanalytics in the discussion. And I'm actually in this lecture going to talk a little bit about um, um, Saussure's structuralist account of semiotics, but we recognize that if there is this thing, the unknown known, as Zizek has um, discussed in a video that I did prior, and obviously Freud really discovered, then that unknown known, something that I do not know that, that is driving me, it, you can describe that thing as desire. My desire then defines who I am as an individual. However, to say that my, and I'm not saying that Freud says this, but However, the fact that my desire and my interests are guiding me, they're all wrapped up within me, within the I, and this is who I am. I am what I do and what I think and what I desire, right? So that's like a generalized account. So um, desire, and I actually want to read uh, a piece from, from uh, Spivak. Um, desire may be a facet of the unconscious, as I said, um, and obviously people would say, no, desire actually is a facet of the unconscious, and thus the subject is said to arise from parasubjective culture. So let me read uh, just a little bit for a quick second, just so I can put this in context. This is uh, 68 and 69. This is not the original, the pagination is not the original, uh, the original publication. This is a reprint, but this is one I had access to, uh, 68 and 69. So here goes the, the, the line. They must align themselves, right? Um, they must align Deleuze and, Deleuze and Foucault. They must align themselves with the bourgeois socialist who fill the place of ideology with who fill the place of ideology with a continuous with a um, um, continuistic unconscious or a parasubjective culture. Uh oh, sorry. Or a parasubjective culture. Um, the mechanical relation, so this idea of parasubjectivity is, is it's, um, think of the, like paranormal, right? Paranormal is sort of not unnatural or not normal, it's like, uh, like a transcendent almost, like ethereal normal. This idea of parasubjectivity in, in a very brief sense is sort of ethereal subjectivity, right? It's, and we'll see this um, later. So parasubjective culture. The mechanical relation by, between desire and interest, between desire and interest, um, is clear in such sentences as, and she quotes, quote, we never desire against our interest, right? We never desire against our interest because interest always follows and finds itself where desire.